This Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, a ten-part parody on the characters of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, begins this edition of Usually Whimsical, the Joe Bevilacqua Radio Theater Collection. And I'm Joe Bevilacqua, your host and producer for this series. Now, The Misadventures of Sherlock Holmes actually began as a script written by the cartoon voice legend Doss Butler. It was entitled uh, Sherlock Holmes in Trouble, from which sprang this entire series. It, but now, let me turn the program over to my new co-host for this series, the true creator of Sherlock Holmes, direct via satellite from his home at 221B Baker Street, London, is Dr. John H. Watson, M.D. In previous narratives on Sherlock Holmes, I've always been able to quote directly from the very full notes which I put from my nimble hand so many years ago. Now, however, I find it necessary to abandon this method and trust my recollections because <clears throat> I just now spilt a cup of Earl Grey all over my diary. <laughs> Pages are wet. The ink is running. But I shall attempt to decipher the muddle with the express purpose of rectifying a few minor inaccuracies concerning my dear colleague's life and career. In the event that you have not yet surmised, I am Dr. John H. Watson. Though I am not quite an antiquated fossil, I do uh, grudgingly accept the fact that I am nearing my twilight years. It is this reluctant realization which compels me to come clean, as Inspector Lestrade might have said. I don't know if he ever did say it, but uh, he might have. At any rate, or any other trite phrase which would act as an alleyway to the cobblestone road of my continuity, several of the most illustrious cases I chronicled were heightened for dramatic effect. For one thing, the five orange tips were merely what Holmes spat out when eating an orange. He made such a mess. The blue carbuncle was really the blue carbuckle which Holmes wore for safety reasons when riding in a handsome cab. The speckled band played every Sunday in Hyde Park, and the sign of the four was really the sign on the corner of Wimpole Street. Now, at a time when sales are up in the bookstalls, I have decided to take these uh, wet-running, tea-stained pages and find the few fragments which remain intact. These extracts from the latter will carry me to those moments which are indelibly fixed in every detail upon my memory. I must admit to reusing that last line. It was first used in The Hound of the Baskerville, chapter 10. I always liked that phrase. <laughs> indelibly fixed, <laughs> etc. <clears throat> but no matter. Baskerville was fiction. What follows is a true story. Besides, I can't sue myself for stealing a line I wrote. Uh, well, can I? Well, anyway, long before a study in scarlet, which incidentally was merely a study in lavender, our very first adventure came to pass. It was in January of 1882 that I first encountered that strange and almost reclusive bohemian I came to know as Mr. Sherlock Holmes. He was living on Baker Street. Not in a flat on Baker Street. Holmes was living on the street itself with the rest of the Baker Street Irregulars. At 28, he was the oldest living street urchin. On the morning after I took Holmes into my lodgings at 221B Baker Street, London, we had the mystery of the creepy hack writer. I was seated, gazing through the foggy glass of the bow window, as my companion was engaged in indoor pistol practice. Good doctor, come quickly. This is important, Holmes. Why do you ask? Because my torso is in a complete and utter state of repose. 
Therefore, only an event of the gravest importance would compel me to alter my present pleasurable position and to some form of ambulation respond to your solicitation to come quickly. That's very, very true. I am properly impressed. Oh, thank you. What does it mean? I'm not budging. But I was just shot, Jack the Ripper. You just shot an oil lamp. Yes, but it could easily have been Jack the Ripper. I had been following him for months and was very nearly on the brink of nabbing him when you kidnapped me. You asked to stay here, Holmes, and you may leave now if you wish. Oh, no, no, I was simply trying to explain that I fired at the lamp for practice so that I shall be ready for that glorious day when I am face to face with a sadistic slasher. <laughs> I must bring him in so that every floozy can floose, every strumpet can strump without fear of Jack the Ripper and his baneful blade. Uh, quite noble of you. Well, thank you, Watson. Watson. Uh, are you sure? Quite. <laughs> well, after all, who better to know your name but you? <laughs> uh, so you were tracking Jack the Ripper when I gave you shelter, eh? Yes. And is that why you were dressed in rags and begging on Baker Street like an irregular? Mm, partly. Partly? I'd also run out of money. What do you mean I kidnapped you, Holmes? Uh, yes, kidnap was a rather harsh word. What I really meant to say was, it was so kind of you, Watson. Watson? You are quite right. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Watson, indeed. Well, Watson, it is kind of you to allow me to share your lodging. Uh, rent free, of course. Believe me, Holmes, you're doing more for me than I could ever hope to reciprocate. I mean, uh, simply your presence here is of the utmost value to me. Value? Uh, morally, uh, not monetarily. I must warn you, Watson, that I am not at all easy to live with. Your revolver practice within doors? <laughs> A trifling inconvenience. I keep my cigars in the coal scuttle and my tobacco in my Persian slippers. No matter. I've been known to perform chemical experiments at odd hours of the night. Will the explosions bother you? Not in the least. I don't sleep for weeks at a time. Charles. I go into a fit of deep depression. Boss. I play my violin day and night. Nampal. And I frequently take in gentlemen callers. As a sideline. Now that's where I draw the line. I'll have none of that debauched behavior going on in my flat. You mean I have to give up being... being... Uh, that's right. Consulting detective? Oh, I thought you meant to... <laughs> Well, never mind what I thought you meant. What is that funny glint in your eye, Watson? Is it a speck of dust? Oh, no, 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 my dear fellow. I was just merely contemplating how jolly good it would be if you were to continue your detective practice. Oh. I could uh, assist you mm -hmm. as your humble friend and by your... <laughs> friend and what? Uh, friend and... Uh, uh, Boswell, <laughs> yes. My humble friend and Boswell. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and now I must warn you, Holmes. I keep a bullpup. That's all right, Watson. I love dogs. Uh, no, Holmes. I mean... Watson, I... look out the window. What do you see? Fog. No, no, down in the street. A man. A rather mysterious-looking chap. <laughs> no, mystery. he's coming up here to see you. Well, how would you possibly know that? For one thing, he has an extremely nervous look on his face. His legs are shuffling about, his arms gesticulating. He's wearing a cypress in his right lapel, a sure sign he's in mourning over the death of a loved one. He's out of breath, meaning he ran here, possibly being chased. And because of the large scar on his left cheek, I recognize him as having followed you last night. And from all that, you concluded the man is coming to see me? No, I concluded it when he rang the front doorbell. Oh, you could still be mistaken, Watson. Highly improbable. Eliminate the improbable, and whatever is left must be the truth. <laughs> mm, I'll be sure and write that down. After all, detection is my line. That man probably isn't coming to see me at all. Of course, I could be wrong. Who is it? He's I. Your lovely landlady and the proprietress of this adorable Baker Street domicile. It's Mrs. Hudson. She owns this fire trap. Then I was right after all. Now come in, Mrs. Hudson. I just thought I'd pop up 
and have a bit of a glance at the new one. Uh, what did you say his name was? Sherlock Holmes. And is this himself? In the flesh. And what a strange green color it has, too. Hello. I believe I've seen you once before, Mr. Holmes. I can't think where. Watson here just took me in last night. Oh, now it comes to me. You're one of those Baker Street irregulars. Oh, you must be mistaken, Mrs. Hudson. You asked me for toppings. Said you wanted to buy an onion bun. I was hungry. Doctor Watson, I'll not be having you taking beggars off the street. Oh, it was a Friday when first I laid eyes on those foul little creatures, the Baker Street irregulars. If they're so irregular, how is it they're always underfoot? Why, a body can't walk two and a quarter paces without running into one of those sterile sites. You'll never see the likes of them in Ireland. No, the good St. Patrick drove them out centuries ago. I think they all came to London. That explains a lot. Baker Street was once a finely spun bit of lace, and its inhabitants, the many threads which made up its ornamental texture, that gossamery, ethereal mesh, which could only have been woven by the enchanted hands of the fairies themselves. I would like an onion bun right now. And now, not only has this delicate lace been infected by hunks of hemp, but there's a hunk of it living in this very flat. Mrs. Hudson, Sherlock Holmes is a part-time detective. When you saw him out of doors, he was tracking a suspect incognito. Oh, not only that, I was dressed as someone else. Detective, eh? Yes, I'd been tracking Jack the Ripper for months. But alas, the notorious fiend remains one of my unsolved cases. Oh, I nearly captured him once, while dressed as a harlot. I lured Jack into a dark courtyard. Inspector Lestrade at Scotland Yard with his hand. Old Jack was just about to fall into my clever trap when suddenly an oil lamp was placed in the window of the nearest brothel. The light shone directly on my person. Jack the Ripper absconded without a trace. What went awry? Well, as Lestrade pointed out later to me, I should have shaved my legs before wearing a dress. Oh, I almost forgot. There's a second reason I came up here this morning. I don't remember there being a first reason. There are a few house rules I want to be laying out for you, Mr. Holmes. Tea is at four, dinner is seven, I'll bring up your mail every day. There's to be no drinking, smoking, singing, music playing, or drug taking. That leaves everything out except breathing. Well, she hasn't finished yet. There'll be no wearing of dresses. Well, that leaves out half my wardrobe. I mean my disguises. Quiet, Holmes. And there'll be no women visitors after hours. Of course, from the looks of you, that won't be a problem. Uh, Holmes will follow all your rules, Mrs. Hudson. I shall make quite sure of that. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Oh, I almost forgot. There's a third reason I came up here this morning. I'm not going to say anything. You've got a creepy-looking gentleman waiting downstairs to see you, Mr. Holmes. Aha, uh-huh, you see, Holmes, you are wrong after all. I'll send him up. There, you stranger, get on up here! I don't understand it. I could have sworn I was right. Which one of you strange bedfellows is Mr. Holmes? Here I am. Uh, Mr. Holmes, I... I... <laughs> oh, I almost forgot. I have a cat downstairs, so there'll be no dogs allowed. Uh, naturally. Uh, good day, Dr. Watson. Good day, Mr. Holmes. Uh, good, good day. day. Here, you, stranger, you may start crying again. Oh, much obliged, Mum. Watson, does she know you keep a bull pup? Just a little bit. Mr. Oh, Isn't it about time for Mrs. Hudson to barge in again? How can you be so, so cold? Well, it is the middle of January. This man has come to us in pain. As a doctor, I would think that you would want to minister to his every need. You think that, eh? Actually, I think I already thought that. How may we be of service to you? My name is Fitzroy McFarlane. Uh, it's a terrible thing what happened to me, it is. Same bloody fair! Same bloody fair, I tell you! Yes, yes, yes. Sit down. Collect yourself, Mr. McFarlane, and tell us all about it. All about what? Why, this cataclysmic catastrophe, of course. Same bloody fair, I tell you! Oh, I believe you've already said that. Oh, just 
trying to win you over with pity. You succeeded. Now, if you have kindly detailed the facts of your case, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's <clears throat> greatest detective, may be able to assist you. My wife has been murdered. When was this? Yesterday, about three o'clock. And you waited until today to come to Holmes for help? Well, I did follow him here last night. I was going to come up, but by then it was 7.30. What happened at 7.30? I had to go home and feed my dog. But but your wife was murdered. Couldn't the dog have waited? Oh, you don't know my dog. He's got a real nice streak, he has. I don't get his things in properly at 7.30. He locks the front door. Won't let me in. I'm to sleep in a doggy house. Watson here knows all about dogs. He keeps a bullpup. Of course, I haven't actually seen it. I believe he keeps it locked in his bedchambers. House rules, you know. Do you know how your wife was murdered, Mr. McFarlane? No, do you? I mean, are there any clues you can present to us which may lead us to the culprit? Well, me and my wife, Sarah, was having a bit of a stroll to St. John's Wood. Heading for Regent's Park to have a look at the pretty birdies, you know. All of a sudden, like, a huge canary swoops down at us and lands a bird dropping right smack on me wife's head. In ten seconds, she was dead. Aha! Wilson, the notorious canary trainer, strikes again. You know the bloke what done in my Sarah? Yes! And, unfortunately, I feel partly to blame. You see, I've been meaning to get around to capturing Wilson. He trains his canaries to drop poisonous birds, well, you know, on unsuspecting women. Mother fixation, I think Floyd calls it. I've just been so busy tracking Jack the Ripper. I don't see. care a brass farthing about old Jack the what's his name. My Sarah's run been murdered on account of you. Uh, Holmes will be glad to compensate you for your loss, Mr. Mitale. I will not, Watson. Got to will, Holmes. I won't. You will. I won't, because this man is an imposter. My dear fellow, ridiculous. No, 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 no. Uh, he's quite right, Dr. Watson. I am not Fitzroy McFarlane, but... Oh. Herbert Winston Newcastle, London Town Tobacconist. Mr. Newcastle is here to try to sell me some pipes and tobacco. Isn't that correct, Mr. Newcastle? They call me Herb. Yes, it's true. A pretty sneaky way of getting in to see you, eh, Mr. Holmes? Well, I don't know about that. Amazing. Then there was no murder. But, but how did you know he was an imposter? Simple. When we saw him down on the curb, his scar was on the right cheek. When he came up to our flat, it was on his left cheek. But Holmes, that scar was always on his left cheek. Is that right? The left cheek. I know. I put it there myself. Oh, my mistake. But I was still correct. He is an imposter. Well, I'll give you that. But how did you know he was a tobacconist? There's a pipe salesman manual jutting out of his pocket. Yes, I do sell pipes. Well, actually, I haven't sold me yet. It's the first day in the job. Would you care to see my card, Dr. Watson? Of course. Well, here you are, then. Hmm. Uh, you're right, Holmes. The tobacconist he is. Well, allow <laughs> me to see the card, Watson. Oh, no need to trouble yourself with such details, my dear chap. I'll just keep it for uh, future reference. Uh, did I hear you say earlier that you were craved an onion bun? Oh, yes, but I... There's, there's a wonderfully quaint little bun boutique at Charing Cross Station. Why don't you go there now? But, but I would really rather like to talk to Mr. Newcastle about his pipes. They call me Herb. However, I really must be going. But then you just arrived. You haven't sold me anything yet. Well, I just remembered I, I have to go feed my mongoose. Uh, he's got a real mean streak. Uh, goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Newcastle. Oh, Mr. Holmes? Yes? Call me her. How very odd. Yeah, very odd indeed. Probably changed his mind. What he has is in such disrepair. Come in. I brought up your mail, Dr. Watson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Hudson. Any mail for me? It helped me in last night. Then there isn't any mail for me? You just moved in last night. No one knows you live here. 
true. But then Mr. McFarlane, I mean Mr. Newcastle, knew I live here. And he followed you here. True. But how did he know that I was Sherlock Holmes? Well, you told him so yourself. Oh, of course. But how did he know you were Dr. Watson? He couldn't have known. But he did. He called you Dr. Watson twice. Oh, how mysterious. I'll tell you what I'm thinking is mysterious. A different man left this flat from the one who entered. Explain that. This was the same man, Mrs. Hudson. He came in disguise. Holmes uncovered his ruse quite adventitiously. But not only that, it was purely by accident. Holmes, you are redundant. Hmm, it's a gift. Now, as to the mystery of how that man knew your name. Well, I'll be letting you two gentlemen bang your heads together. Good day. Hmm. Well, I guess there's nothing left to do but head over to Charing Cross for my onion bun. No need to rush back. Hello, Watson. The non-adventures of Sherlock Holmes. No. Unadventures of Sherlock Holmes. The honest and true adventures of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Never. Sherlock Holmes, The Complete Memoirs of a Non-Entity. The Adventures of Dr. Watson. Hmm, I like that one. Yes, just a second. It's like living in Charing Cross Station. Oh, it's you again. Come right in. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Do have a seat, please. As you saw on my card, I am not Fitzroy McFarlane, nor am I Herbert Winston Newcastle. And I was not here to see Sherlock Holmes. I, I was here to see you. Another disguise? Did you, please? I, I've been a lot of things in my life, Dr. Watson. Well, three of them were just this morning. I was a doctor myself in India. Strangely enough, I served as a medical physician in the Second Afghan War. I was forced to leave, though. I received a severe leg wound. Or was it an arm wound? I was also a writer like yourself. It was only not a very good one, and I'd be the first to admit that. In fact, I just did. A hack writer is what I think they call me, and well, I've made a fair living in the past, but recently, the only writing I've done was for the fly leaf of my old boys' school annual. Oh, I see. And so, and that is why I'm answering the advertisement you placed in the Strand magazine. You'd like to act as my literary agent? Uh, yes, being a formal writer myself. I, I do have all the right contacts. You think you can get my stories printed in the Strand? Oh, as easy as bumblebees and dish towels. Is that a yes? As true as grasshoppers and baby booties. Oh. Well, then, uh, I believe we have a deal, Mr. Uh... Oh, I've forgotten your real name. <laughs> you were so Betty, actually. The name on your card? Uh, Doyle. Also... Conan Doyle. Oh, Mr. Doyle. Do you really think we can mold a hero out of this Sherlock Holmes castle? Oh, oh I do indeed. Indeed I do. That's why I'm here after all. And of course, we will have to stretch the truth a bit. <laughs> we'll have to bend it out of shape. In the name of dramatic effect. Not to mention fame and fortune. Oh, you can mention it. <laughs> I just did. The adventure of Sherlock Holmes. Yes, that is. Uh, now, uh, Doctor, and uh, as to the details, uh, you'll begin writing as soon as possible. Uh, the stories will have my name on them, Jerry Doyle. Uh, 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 printed from the reminiscences of Johnny Potter.
In the year of 1878, I took my degree of Doctor of Medicine at the University of London and proceeded to Netley to take up... Come in. Dr. Watson, did you know yet another fellow left your flat? He looked completely different from the other two. Uh, that is, the one who entered but never left, and the one who left but never entered. Or was it the other way around? Yeah, that's quite right, Mrs. Hudson. Good doctor, I have returned. Fairly obvious, Holmes. Hello, Mrs. Hudson. <laughs> you know what, old fellow? I detect a hint of hostility on her part. Oh, never mind, Mrs. Hudson. Her hoof is worse than her bite. <laughs> mm. Speaking of bites, after what can only be described as a fairly good onion bun, I took the liberty of picking up a tin of Mother Malone's mongrel meal. The only mongrel meal that's mashed. <laughs> Dog food. Yes, and it's quite good. Well, I couldn't resist it. I was getting a bit hungry on my journey home. Ugh. But don't worry, there's plenty left for the bullpup. Unless, of course, you'd like to try some yourself. Mmm, delicious. Holmes, I don't have a dog. But, but you told me you keep a bullpup. That's exactly what you said. I keep a bullpup. To keep a bullpup is an old Anglo-Indian expression meaning to go into fits of quick temper. And if you don't leave me alone, I'm going to cut off your ears and bronze them for bookends. Well, it's just as well that you don't have a dog. Why? Now I can finish the tin. Are you sure you don't want some? <sighs> What is that strange expression on your face, Watson? Are you keeping a bull pup now? No, no, my dear fellow. I was merely remembering what shrewd perception you showed in uncovering that imposter earlier today. Mm -hmm. I would never have guessed he was a shag salesman. Marvelous. Yes. My powers of observation amaze even me sometimes. I think I'm going to increase my load of cases, Watson. I think the time has come, the walrus said, to share my rare gift with the masses. I think I shall, from this day forward, devote my life to right and wrong and avenging injustices. I think I shall become the greatest living crime fighter the world has ever known. I, I think, think I'm, I'm going, going to vomit. I have ever met. I think I have an exceptionally strong fingers. I am six feet high. I think I shall play my violin. I think my violin is broken. I think I'll take some more things. And so the mystery of the creepy hat writer comes to a curious close. Life with Holmes was to become curiouser and curiouser, with his severe drug mania eventually threatening to check his less than remarkable career. But that's another story. One which I will present to you, my faithful readers, in full detail in a future enthralling... Oh. Installment of The Misadventures of Sherlock Holmes. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Joining me in the cast were Henry J. Quinn as Dr. Watson, Jan Meredith played Mrs. Hudson, and Sherlock Holmes was Vernon Morris. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs>